Friends, good morning. Welcome to Worship with Cherokee Park United Church. It is good to be with you this day. I find that each Sunday, the ritual of gathering to worship together is a time and a space, a habit by which we are formed, by which we root ourselves in the message of God's love that we might be strengthened, comforted, and empowered to live as followers of Jesus in the world by our gathering together. So welcome to this worship. I would share with you um, two announcements this morning. The first is that um, the Cherokee Park United Church Council met this past week in one of the things we did was determine some thresholds, some criteria to guide us as we think about when we might be able to gather in person again for worship in a hybrid way. Um, and if that, uh, when that's able to happen, at what point or under what circumstances would we need to consider shifting back to virtual um, as it relates to COVID-19. So um, that has been shared in the weekly email that went out this past week, and we'll share it again upcoming, but also reach out to me and anyone on the church council if you have questions about that, um, how we arrived at that, um, anything around that. We wanna be transparent and communicative about how we are trying to both keep our um, sense of community and connection with one another as a congregation and um, provide safeguards as we continue to weather the pandemic. The other bit of news is that the annual Overcoming Racism Conference is set this year for November 12th and 13th. That's a Friday, Saturday. Registration is open. So I would encourage you to check it out. There's uh, amazing workshops on the docket, um, great speakers and panels planned. We also, as a sponsor of this event, have some complimentary registrations. So reach out to me if you are interested in those. I'm glad to see those get used for those who are thinking of attending. Okay. As we gather uh, together this morning, just want to extend to you, give you permission to rest, to just be in this space and time that we have together, to let go of the need to fix things, the need to um, analyze or solve and to just accept that we are invited to be together in the presence of God this morning. And what a gift that is for us. In your own homes, I invite you, if you have a candle to light, to do that. And we'll enter, we'll continue our worship time this morning, um, holding some silence together as we listen for the movement of God's spirit with and among us.
morning prayer comes from um, Janet Morley. Oh God, you took upon you the yoke of humanity and the burden of love and did not find it easy. Let us learn from you to share the weight of all this aching world, that our souls might be light, our hearts rested, as together we are carried by you in Jesus Christ. Amen. Will you join with me in our call to worship? We are here not because we have found God, but because God, our creator, has called us here. Challenging us to accept the cost and joy of discipleship and to be servants in service of all creation. But the call is also God's promise. A promise of forgiveness of sins and fullness of grace courage in the struggle for justice and peace, and life eternal with God, whose kingdom has no end. May we be united as one, encouraged in heart and provoked in spirit. Thanks be to God that in challenge and in calm, in sorrow and in joy, Jesus walks with us. Let's sing our energizing opening hymn, uh, Woke Up This Morning, sing, clap, dance, and um, rejoice along at home with us. From Mark 10, verses 35-45. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to us to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What is it you want me to do for you? They said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand, one and one at your left in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink, or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, <coughs> We are able. Then Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism, baptism which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But 
to sit in my right hand or in my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as the rulers lord it over them, and the great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Here's what the Spirit is saying to you guys, people. Thanks to you guys. Good morning to all the children who are worshiping with us this morning. So glad to be with you in worship today. And I'll just say I'm I'm bummed that we can't be together. I'm bummed that this pandemic continues to drag on and and makes it a little bit too risky for us to be in person face to face with one another. But I'm glad we have this technology to connect us. Well, this morning we heard a story about Jesus and two of the disciples come to Jesus and they ask Jesus to promise them positions of greatness. They say, we want to be great. Save us the best spots at the table on your right side and on your left side. We want to sit right next to you. And Jesus tells them that to be great sometimes means we have to think about others before ourselves and think about what other people need or want and put that ahead of what we need and want. Not all the time, but some of the times that's what it means. And that's pretty different because these disciples, they were thinking about greatness. They were thinking about the special and cool things that they get, that they get to do, the privileges or the, um, the, rec the attention that people would pay to them the way people would clap for them or congratulate them or celebrate them. They weren't thinking about being great as a way of helping other people. Now, if you have sisters or brothers or friends, um, you might think of some ways that you've already experienced this, right? Sometimes we have to wait our turn Sometimes we have to share things. Um, sometimes what someone else wants for, for dinner or for a movie, they might get to have the turn and not us, right? The other thing I think about too is in soccer. Yes, soccer. Maybe you have played soccer, but I think about what Jesus is saying, that to be great, sometimes you have to think of other people first. And let's imagine together, imagine yourself on a green soccer field, a warm, sunny day. You are running down the field with the ball. You're headed towards the goal. And the defenders from the other team come and they swarm you all around. And it is going to be very hard for you to take your shot. And in that case, the thing that would make you great is not trying to get through but maybe it's to pass the ball to someone else on your team who is wide open, who can shoot it right into the back of the net because they have a better shot than you do. So this week, I would invite you, just pay attention. Pay attention to your interactions with your classmates, your friends, your family, and think about when God might be asking you to think about someone else's needs or what someone else wants. And think about, maybe this is the time where I can let that other person have their way or be the focus of attention. All right? 
Thank you, thank you for being here. So glad to be with you all. I hope you have an amazing week. See you next week. Bye. Well, you've likely never heard of Robert Greenleaf before. His one connection to Minnesota is that he graduated from Carleton College in 1925. He went on to have a long career working for AT&T. But the thing that made him famous was that in 1970, after he had retired, he continued to write and publish a lot. And he coined this idea of servant leadership in an essay in 1970. And he basically argued that the most effective leadership model is where leaders serve their people, their employees, helping them grow, helping them have the resources and support they need to succeed. And that this model exists in contrast to normal models where leaders are intended to serve the institution, um, the company itself, the budget. Well, today, servant leadership is buzzy. It's everywhere. Um, corporate world, but also nonprofit world, and definitely in the religious world, this idea of servant leadership um, has a wide following. And in fact, in 1970, uh, in the wake of publishing this essay, one of the articles that came out in response in critique of Greenleaf's um, concept of servant leadership came from um, the, a, a, a Christian angle, basically arguing that, in fact, Jesus is the source of the idea of servant leadership and not this Robert Greenleaf fellow. They were basically saying that in essence, Robert Greenleaf plagiarized this idea off of Jesus's homework. Well, you can see where these critics got that idea. In Mark's gospel, Jesus is frequently talking about the first will be last and the last will be first. To be great, you must be a servant. If you wish to attain great things, you must come at them as a child. So Jesus does embody much of what this idea purports in his own living. He eats with sinners, common folk, poor people. He heals, which if you were differently abled or sick, almost automatically meant you were on the outside looking in at that time and still in our times in a lot of ways. Well, this morning's passage starts, however, with James and John coming to Jesus, wanting to extract from him a promise, a promise that he would give them places of prominence when he comes in his glory the right hand and the left hand. Now, despite Jesus predicting his own death multiple times at the hands of the empire, the disciples clearly, they're not thinking about that. They're picturing some great triumph. They're picturing glory as they are used to seeing it and thinking about it military victories and power. Well, at Jesus' crucifixion, Mark notes quite clearly that on Jesus' left and on Jesus' right were not two of his disciples, but were bandits, two men considered criminals. Jesus asks them if they can drink of the same cup, endure the same baptism. He's alluding not to glory, but to the heartbreak, the hardship he will face for upsetting the apple cart of those in power. 
And James and John, still oblivious, respond quite confidently, of course we can drink from that same cup and endure that same baptism. Unaware of just what Jesus is implying. So what is it? What is it we come to Jesus seeking? Is it greatness? Would we admit it if it was? Is it eternal life? Is it something else? I'm guessing for most of us, we don't come seeking Jesus because we wish to endure pain or um, more hurt or difficulty. Jesus turns everything the disciples know, what we know, on its head. You want greatness, Jesus says? Okay. But then he says, oh, all these rulers you see, all these great leaders, they're tyrants. As the, uh, uh, Mark Davis astutely points out when he studied this passage and wrote about it, he says, quote, for Jesus' followers, one of the awful effects of living under the empire is the temptation to imitate it. In other words, to picture greatness as militaristic or economic or political only. To be great, Jesus says, be a servant. Serve others rather than seeking to be served. Servant leadership. Sounds good. And it can be. However, it is very context dependent, isn't it? The pastor and scholar Raquel St. Clair uh, undertakes a womanist interpretation and reading of Mark's gospel and looks at the themes of discipleship as they're presented in the gospel of Mark. And she's quick to point out the potential problems with this emphasis on um, servanthood as a necessary piece of true discipleship. That very language, she maintains, um, it maintains rather than challenges the sinful social structures when it is applied to those who are oppressed. She writes, quote, servanthood in an African-American female context equals suffering. Therefore, discipleship that is understood as servanthood degenerates into spiritually sanctioned suffering. And in so doing, we inadvertently equate having a servant status with having Christian virtue. Discipleship must be contextually dependent. For those of us who are white, serving in ways that put our privilege at the feet of black and indigenous and immigrant neighbors in service to people of color, that is a faithful act of discipleship. On the other hand, a woman in a boardroom full of men following Jesus where subservience is the highest virtue only does harm and reinforces patriarchal systems in all likelihood. Well, more humorful example of contextualizing what faithful discipleship looks like can be drawn from the uh, short-lived TV show called Freaks and Geeks, which follows um, some, you know, this, a drama comedy set on these high schoolers in the 1980s um, and the main characters, as the title suggests, are freaks and geeks. Well, the geeky Bill, who is long-limbed and gangly and buck-toothed and bespectacled, 
is tired of the same athletic jocks getting to pick the teams every day in gym class. And every day, Bill and his friends are always the last to be picked. And they're always relegated to positions where they virtually have no possibility of involvement in what's going on, the far, far outfield. Well, the injustice of this eats at Bill until he decides to take some small measure of rebellion against uh, the coach, Coach Fredericks, by prank calling him. And when the coach picks up, Bill, in a uh, hilariously uh, off voice, utters a barrage of juvenile but totally G-rated uh, name-calling through the phone, and the coach hangs up. But of course, the coach quickly figures out who was doing this, and he calls Bill into his office and sits him down to talk, and here Bill lets out the frustration that led to these calls. Being picked last is always embarrassing, and there's never any chance to improve or even play or participate in what's going on. Because those who are doing the choosing send the geeks and the unathletic away, banishing them effectively from playing. Well, the coach stammers, well, it's not my fault you get picked last. Yes, it is, Bill Robots. You've got the power. You could change everything. Well, at this, the coach is baffled but curious, and so he asks, well, how would I do that? Well, simple, Bill replies. You let me pick the teams. And so you cut to the next day where uh, tall and awkward Bill picks his friend Gordon Crisp, the fat and lovable nerd, to be the other captain. And they delight in picking all the kids who are usually picked last and leaving the more athletic uh, classmates to be picked last for once and to play in the far, far outfield. And as this is ongoing, one of the jocks leans over to the other and mutters, I guess the geeks have inherited the earth. Friends, may God make us wise to see how we might follow Christ in serving others. And may we also be discerning in recognizing that not all discipleship looks the same. But all discipleship seeks to uplift the downtrodden, to ease the burdens of suffering, and joyfully aid and abet God's liberating purpose in our world. Amen. join together in pray and praying this morning. Whenever you are viewing this, whether it is Sunday morning as we live stream it, as we premiere it, 
whether it is Sunday evening or again during the week, whenever you are praying, we are praying together. And so take heart that we draw near to God as one. We are not alone. Let us hold this space together to be in conversation with our Creator. I invite you to be in prayer for those people, those loved ones in your life who are in particular need of comfort or grace or uplift, who have particular challenges. Let's hold those people close and pray for them. Let's turn our prayers now towards those places in our world where there is most desperate need of justice, of peace, of hope. Let us hold those places up to God now. Let us be in prayer for our own selves. Pray for your own self. Offer what you are feeling to God, your anger, your hope, your joy, your despair, your um, numbness, your boredom. Pray for yourself now.
And finally, let us turn our prayers towards gratitude, praying with thanksgiving for those things in our lives for which we are grateful, which make it rich and good and blessed. Blessed one, pour out your tenderness over the earth where our bones are weary, our spirits flagging, uplift us, lead us onward, give us rest, and make, O oh God, the tide of justice rise and rise and rise over the earth. May we understand the role of your faithful people throughout all creation to be prophets, to be gift givers, to bring goodness and blessing May solidarity be the watchword of all the people of earth and all the goodness of your creation. Give us those equal measures of humility and boldness and crown our efforts to follow you, O God, with wisdom. Receive our grateful hearts and hear us as we pray the words of Jesus, our creator who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Mm. Well, we're, if we were in person, this would be the part of our worship where we would collect an offering. Um, so I just take this moment to say thank you. Thank you to you who continue to send in your pledges or your special offerings or one-time gifts. Um, thank you for the myriad other ways that you support Cherokee Park United Church's ministry and community through your time, through your love, through your being, your true and free and God-blessed self. Thank you. Please keep that up. Um, and let's sing our doxology and our sending hymn together.
we join with me in our commission. Our lives are filled with struggles and suffering. None of us are immune. The key to full life in Christ is not to rise above it, but to struggle together and help one another along the way, knowing that God is with us in every moment. This is service. If we seek to serve and lift one another up, commit to struggle together, together we will witness Christ's glory. May it be so. If you have bubbles at home, I invite you to join in in this interactive blessing. Friends, may the love of God grow in you. May the justice and solidarity of Christ grant you strength and be your bread for the journey. And may that sweet, sweet communion of the Holy Spirit lead you home and give you rest. This day and evermore, go, beloveds. Go. Amen.